So thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Very much appreciated. We're here to uh, celebrate the Stealing Light Anthology. If any of you need any copies of it, we have it here. Happy to sell it for you. And I would suggest getting the uh, some of the writers that are here getting their autograph on it. Uh, and that's enough out of me. So I'm going to introduce Paul Hunter, who's going to act as the MC tonight. And then if anybody needs to get on the open mic, we're going to have a, a few open mics, not too many. And... Uh, um, limited and so we will get going. So Paul Hunters, uh, I'll, I'll try to be good and read what's here. No. <laughs> Paul Hunter's poems have appeared in numerous journals as well as in seven full-length books and three chapbooks. His first collection of farming poems, Breaking Ground, which I do have a copy of from 2004 from Silver Fresh Review Press, was reviewed in the New York Times and received the 2004 Washington State Book Award. So he tried again with a second volume of Farming Poems, <laughs> Ripening, was published in 2007. A third companion volume, Come to Harvest, appeared in 2008. And the fourth from the same publisher, Stubble Field, appeared in 2012. He's been a featured poet on the News Hour, has a prose book on small scale sustainable farming, one seed to another, which I also have, the new Small Farming published by the Small Farmer's Journal. His book of prose poetry, Clownery, in lieu of a life spent in harness, was published by De Villa Art and Books in 2017. And he has a forthcoming book of 18 contemporary cowhand stories, Sit a Tall Horse, which should be out in January of 2020. And there's many other things to tell you about Paul Hunter, but he would appreciate it if I didn't. Paul Hunter! <laughs> We're going to move right along. What it meant. The dawn that skinny hog appeared, somehow in the dark must have flung herself up the wood pile, over the fence, into the pen, which woke all our barrows and gilts. A wild one out of nowhere with no nose rings, tags, or ear slits, who performed one spectacular leap into captivity no one saw coming, that by sunup sat waiting breakfast, happy as could be, singing, slobbering, with all our crowd grunting approval, while we sleepy ones served up the usual mush and slops before any woke to what the stranger meant by joining us, what it must have took. Looked her over a minute, all at once dawned how now she might belong to no one, not even herself, leastwise hardly deserving the pack of us, still blindly stumbling over chores, who maybe finally count these those dozen blind pink babies in the straw all round without so much as taking off their shoes, which meant this was no gift from neighbors dropped off at our doorstep, <coughs> but her plain choice to say how wild she was. How wild again she might never come to be. <coughs> the, uh, we're in a pickle. The introduction to this poem, we're in a pickle. And we don't quite know how to how we're going to get out the other side. A climate pickle. We got a pickle in the White House. We got pickles everywhere we look. Come the downturn. When the people go nowhere much anymore, live near where they work, walk there and back, bicycle, maybe on occasion, especially good and bad weather, choose to work right here where they play as if old, as of old, come together to make music, dance in the open, maybe join to start wine, pluck and crush grapes, sing of weddings, funerals, while babies nibble cakes. Now, when no one, not even the government, flies airplanes much anymore, all intent on saving the thin air that field workers burn on hard labor and fires, rare emergencies, as for birds and pollinators, 
lured to settle, give us a hand, and for migrating herds, all those who pause passing through, who breathe deep, admire fleeting abundance, saved up to offer the next one who shows for a look around, seeking shade and quiet, a splash of cool water, shelter meant not as capture, but a living chance, an open door. And that, and I'm going to read one that's in this. <clears throat> And this is this is this is something that happened to me in uh, 1970 or 71. You know, I was no child bride or anything. But this is called <laughs> executioner. <clears throat> exactly as I recall it, exactly as it happened. We were hippies, sitting there in a sweltering bar in the 60s in Mankato on a muddy little river the Sioux had swept down like a flash flood a century before. When a red-faced timber cruiser with his ball cap on backwards, six foot six, pot-bellied, belligerent, pulled up a seat and shouted in my ear how just that day he had surveyed and cut the last virgin walnut tree in all Minnesota. He said it had belonged to an old farmer who held out to his dying breath, but then his widow had been moved into a rest home while the kids went ahead and settled the estate because they had waited enough. And you couldn't believe a tree could grow that magnificent. Reaching up and out from a trunk near 18 feet around, measuring 80,000 board feet enough to make a dozen houses from the ground up out of pure walnut. If you could imagine what that might be worth. And you couldn't even tell how old it was because the heartwood was so black the rings all ran together and standing on that stump the size of a Cadillac seeing the hole it felt like it left in the sky got to me for a minute. And while he swirls his beer to wash down the lump in his throat, I lean close and ask why he couldn't leave it be. He says, I hear what you're saying. I hated cutting that tree. You think I don't have feelings? But you know, business is business. And there's plenty more guys where I come from who'd fell and bucker as soon as your back is turned without so much as a buy your leave. So why shouldn't it be me doing what has to be done, not so much for the profit, but to keep off the butchers and see that the job is done right? They were out there. They were out there. Um, that's enough for me for now. Let's have a look at the at the rest of you guys. Um, incidentally, you guys, including women, and used by women, that expression, you guys, is apparently goes back into the 20s and 30s in England. It's very old. Or kind of old. Or anyway. So, Martha McAvoy Linehan is a Seattle-based poet, art maker, chemical dependency professional, and integrated movement therapist, IMT. She co-founded with her sister Jenny Linehan, Word Upshot, am I saying that right? Yeah. Upshot. A photography and poetry project designed for adolescent girls. In recovery. She later adapted the scope of the project to address the specific needs of young women who have been commercially sexually exploited. Martha currently works as a counselor, yoga instructor, 
and art facilitator with the Organization for Prostitution Survivors, OPS. Uh, and there's a website. A social service agency and a agent of change that envisions a world of gender, gender equality, free from all forms of oppression and, expo and exploitation. She has a collection of poems, Au revoir, Au revoir Georgette, Georgette. <laughs> Poetry Around Press, and a chapbook, Sister, Poems and Images, 2019. Please welcome Martha Lennon. sister, um, a few poems, and a cop there are copies, I have copies of sister here tonight, um, and if you would like a copy, I would love to give you one, so just let me know. I actually also have copies of Wolvor Georgette, which um, I would also like, if you would like to check it out, um, I'd love to give, give you one. Um, I'm going to dedicate my portion of tonight's reading. Um, your poems were really beautiful, Paul. And, um, yeah, we are in a pickle. <laughs> um, I'd like to dedicate my portion of the reading to a young woman. Um, her name's Mary Ann, and she's currently incarcerated in the Women's Correctional Facility at Purdy. And um, kind of along the lines of some of the things you were addressing, um, the abuse to prison pipeline is real. Um, it's a really thriving business, and uh, and she's someone I try to support um, while she's in there. She's 19, uh, and she's going to be there for a really long time. And um, we write letters, and that's really beautiful. And I get to go see her sometime. And I like to think of her as a little sister. I do think of her as a little sister. Um, sisterhood. This is how we move in and out of our lives, occupying identities, buildings, people. We take shapes. We sit around tables with strange casseroles. We make decisions or not about of our lives. We draw conclusions, mess up, abide. We sit with loved ones, argue and squirm our way through bad weather. We lose people. Might be looking them right in the eyes, holding their hand even, unaware that we are losing them at all. We hold on, and we don't realize they are already gone. They just vanish. We walk into the house and don't ever find them again. They get swiped away from us. And if we are lucky, we get to sit around a new table one day we learn how to live again. We turn to the person next to us. We turn and look right into the face of the person next to us. And we see ourselves. And we see someone new. Different and the same. This is what we do. We grieve, succumb, transform. We become sisters. <clears throat> Um, this one's for Jet. She's <coughs> a sister. Um, and for my op sisters. I work with a lot of really incredible women. Um, I'm really lucky to get to do what I do. I get so much. I receive so much. If I lose my sister, 
if I lose the sheen of my soul, lose my bearings, my who I am, my worth and will to live, if I crawl into the earth, disappear underground, roll myself up into dead, wet leaves and never say a word, you will know I have lost her. And if by some freak force of nature I emerge from there one day to find another sister, if I am pushed or pulled out of such dense, unforgiving inertia to find her there waiting for me to walk into her hard working arms, then you will know for certain that there are sisters and there are sisters. And they are here, standing their ground, taking up space, a sturdy lot, feisty, emotional, bright. They are young and they are aging. They have buried their mothers. They have buried their best friends. They have buried themselves. Sung songs without words, visited towns that never existed, places you would never choose to go. They have pierced holes in their own bodies and deflated raged and cut when they couldn't stand the pain beneath the skin anymore and emerged loved right out of that blasted inertia willed into motion by the woman standing next to them ready for battle ready to go because it just got too damn hard not to shine anymore. Hi, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> um, so in this little book, um, I, I made it in 2018, um, which was significant for me. I was, I, I was determined to, to make this little book. Uh, uh, before the end of the decade, um, after my sister Jenny died, and um, and so I did that. Um, and there are images in it. There are photographs, um, which I didn't know I was going to include these, but um, they're really as important to me as as the words. Um, but you'll have to like. Interested in seeing what I'm talking about, um, and please do. To be your sister, one. <clears throat> if I were to write a thousand poems about being your sister, I'd still be at a loss. If I were to write about grief for the rest of my life, maybe. I'd find my way back to you. This is the stupid little lie I hold in the hollow of my hands. The prayer where you live inside of a perfect bead. Microscopic like the ones they FedExed halfway around the world to you while we waited in Spokane. Thousands of magic radioactive beads funneled into your liver. Killer beads on a mission to destroy the tumors. Remember when we discovered them? How we loved those fucking beads. Promising time. To be your sister, too. We were gifted. I followed you here to the Northwest so we could be us. I moved right into your neighborhood to give us even more time together. 
time in the morning before work, time at the gym, dinner time, random free time, time on weekends, time at the lake, lying around with your daughter in the white dog time, time sitting together at your kitchen table, time on the back steps, time. We began to look more and more alike. Our hair turned red. <coughs> we liked to do the same things. Goodwill, coffee, bands. We fused into something new. We became somebody. We were gifted. to be your sister three. This isn't at all where I plan to go with this. I can't seem to finish anything. Everything I start turns into something else. I start out in Paris and wind up in Seattle without you, caught in a spring hailstorm an angry, mangy, scared out of its mind cat trying to navigate a strange suburb. When all I want to say is, when all I've ever really wanted to say is what it was to be your sister, what it was to be me. has no control over what will come <laughs> which is which is which is um, plenty daring let me tell you you know we could live in a world where they uh, they said they say well I'll have to see every word that you're that's going to come out of your mouth first and it's got to be typed and it's got to be typed neatly and no misspellings you have to pronounce the misspellings. Is Gary here? No. Unless he's hiding really well. Okay, well, I thought maybe he snuck in while we're So we're going <clears> to... <throat> Anna Balland is the author of Horse Thief, Kurt Stone Press, 2004, a collection of short fiction, which I have read every word of spanning cultures and continents that was a finalist for the Pacific Northwest Book Award. Two earlier books of poetry are Out of the Box and Spread Them Crimson Sleeves Like Wings. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Spread Them Crimson wing Sleeves Like Wings. She edited, co-edited Poets Against the War, poems protesting the Gulf War in 1991, and edited Words from the Cafe, an anthology, which uh, she was behind every part of it. I guess it's, yeah, I'll just I'll just read what it says here. Uh, an anthology, Raven Chronicles Press, 2016, an anthology of writing by people in recovery. Anna teaches adults in recovery from the traumas of homelessness, addiction, and mental illness, with the Seattle's past. Half with Art, and is the founder and host of the weekly Safe Place Writing Circle at Recovery Cafe in <laughs> Seattle. Please, please welcome Anna Bell. And I should mention that the book Words from the Cafe, which is up there, is from Safe Place Writing Circle, and that Three people from Safe Place, <laughs> Safe Place Writing Circle are here tonight. So, hey, you guys, my reading's for you. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to just mention a couple of things real quick. One is that th this, this is fiction, and the character is a young Rama woman. But the piece doesn't use the word Rama because it's set in 1947, and at that time that word was not in general usage. 
so the word is, is still gypsy. But having said that, I just want to bring people's attention to it's I am always getting snagged. I'll be reading, you know, it might be a poem, it might be a novel, it could be an article, but something I'm really, really into, and all of a sudden, there's one of the stereotypes of Roma people again, you know, about being free, about thieving, being lazy, you know, or the word jip comes up, all these different things. So I just want to put out a plea to please pay attention to it, because we're talking about a real people, millions, including people in this country who usually don't reveal their identity, and people who are still persecuted and literally fighting for their lives in some places still in Europe. So, <clears throat> Okay, this piece is called Susie, and it's set in 1947 in London. <coughs> I made myself up. Not English, not Hungarian, not Gypsy. I took what there was and made this, Susie, a 19-year-old office worker who writes poetry on the sly, who cooks egg and chips for a widowed dad, who lives in London, and who is about to be married. The mirror tells me I'm black hair, brown skinned, my eyes as dark as the gypsy girl I was born as. My fiance, Colin, tells me I'm beautiful. He tells me this while tracing the shape of my nose and bones of my face with a fingertip. Perhaps we are lying under a tree. Perhaps the tree is in Finsbury Park or Hampstead Heath, or out of London altogether, the day we take the train away from the soot, chimney pots and ruins of war. Yes, it is that day, on the edge of Epping Forest, a picnic basket open beside us, its contents half eaten, Sun streams through the leaves of the trees and Colin's eyes shine in the green yellow light. His iris is the color of leaves. He is propped up on one elbow and leans over me. When he tells me I'm his princess, his queen, Venus herself, I believe him. His voice is a lilt. It touches me softly rising and falling like the hills of Wales he came from. When I speak, London comes out of my mouth. It's hurried, choppy rhythm, comfortable, the way a pair of shoes feels after being worn day after day. Sometimes I wonder how I used to sound, my little girl self before Jujita became Susie, when I still lived in Budapest. But that little girl has flown far away. Now Mama is dead, and Papa has gone quiet. Hungary has gone quiet. Become a dream with a courtyard. Become shreds of a half-forgotten language, fragments of song. Become a blue river. Become the memory of a sunflower. The memory of a sister. Her face fading like a photograph left in sunlight. I place English flowers on Mama's grave. Long stemmed daisies and forget me nots. She lies in an English graveyard. Her stone says, Elizabeth, wife of Alexander, not Urshibet, wife of Shandor. The war has ended. London is a shambles. My mother is dead. But I, I am here. I eat fish and chips. Toad in the hole, mashed potatoes, jam donuts and custard tarts. I read the Bronte sisters and poems by Robert Browning. Jane Eyre is my sister and London is my home. My wedding dress is borrowed. I am borrowed. I don't fit this country, but I'll do. My skin looks very brown against the white satin of my ill-fitting wedding dress but the Church of England vicar will marry me just the same. If I'd stayed in Hungary, I'd have been rounded up like my sister Rosa and the other gypsies, and I'd be dead. Or maybe I'd be alive, but barely, 
thin as a shadow with a number tattooed on my arm. Like my Auntie Marika, when after the war she arrived on our doorstep from who knows where to whisper those terrible stories about what happened to my sister, to her husband, to their babies. Stories about Granny and Uncle Jaska, my cousins Clary and Christo, all dead. Everyone I loved, dead or disappeared. But these are things I mustn't speak of. Papa won't have it. The sadness because of it killed Mama. Dear Mama. Oh, how she pulled and tugged at me when she died, as if she wanted to take me with her. And for a long time, that's what I wanted. Until one day I woke up and decided, no, no, I'm not going anywhere. And Mama just floated away like a breeze going out of the window instead of coming in. So here I am, alive, ready to marry and have children. Pinch me, Colin. Tell me I'm still here. You're here, love. We're here. I'm so glad of Colin's voice, the spring in his step and the firm, believable shape of him. So glad of our future together, of the bustle of London, the building and rebuilding going on all over the city these days. Sometimes when we're in the park, I loosen my hair from its combs and pins and let it tumble down my back. I kick off my shoes and run barefoot between trees. Colin thinks of me as a gypsy then. A real gypsy girl, he says. And Free as a gypsy. Nothing could be further from the truth. And if I laugh, it's because I don't know what else to do. I shriek and I run, and when I start running, my breath comes in spurts. I'm remembering something from a long time ago. A song, snatches of melody, and then it is gone. I want to say, being a gypsy isn't about freedom, Colin. It's about persecution. But I say nothing. Instead, I brush the dust off my feet and slip them back into my shoes. I like shoes with heels that click. I like walking in the city. I want people to know I passed by, that Susie was here, and I'm not leaving. There are many things Colin still doesn't know. How it is sometimes, walking down Essex Road on my way to work, stepping firmly, holding my head high. I hear cat calls and whistles, men calling out from building sites. Hold up a minute, darling. What you doing tonight then, love? But it's not always darling or love they call me. Sometimes it's blacky or darky or jip, and it's as if I'm back on the school playground again. The other day, a gob of spit landed at my feet. England for the English! I cranked my head a little higher, stepped over the spit and kept walking, letting my shoes rat-a-tap my reply. Just one more office girl, hurrying past a bomb site on her way to a bus stop breathing the same dust as everyone else. There's never any sense in the looking back. I just go on. Thank you. <laughs> you. Joni Stanglin is the author of The Scene You See. In both hands and in the room, into the rumored spring all from Ravenna Press, as well as three chapbooks. In 2019, she received the Crosswinds Poetry Journal Grand Prize. Her poems have appeared in Prairie Schooner, Mid-American Review, The Southern Review, and other journals. Jo Joni holds an MFA from the Rainier Writing Workshop. Please welcome Joni Stanglin.
husband's a furniture maker, so in our house we just kind of move things where we want. <laughs> so thank you, Paul, and thank you all for being here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent. So I'd like to start out by reading the poem that is in Last Call, and this is Bending Moment. And the tree that is described in this poem was at, if anyone's familiar out in Bothell, there's a creek called North Creek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's this creek that flows through an office park. Um, I spent a lot of time there. Bending moment. Here I wear another year like a ring inside a tree. Middle of the island where the creek runs wide, a poplar leans a little more. Winded and rain-freed, it lowers like a supplicant, an ordinary man returning from his mending journey to the outer fences and back below cloud wisps, a break, the cataclysm of stars reeling, his boots dew-swept on the track across the gusts and up the three wood stairs, walks into the kitchen, unaccustomed to the sudden warmth and simmer, sets his hat on the table, strips off his woolen gloves and steps inside his lover's arms, lets his body into that peach and iron, hands and hair where it parts, the ear against his cheek and then breath, as though it is the center of gravity's long, sure pole, the way the tree falls, for the earth it has known. Thank you. And then I'd like to read a couple poems from the scene you see. Um, continuing on kind of the love poem um, theme, this is In the Country Called Marriage. The skies and orchard, peach harvest of another morning we peel and swallow a cure for yesterday's mistakes, my doubts in blue cotton dresses, the watch running backwards. Every year's another tree we sleep under while cows in the pasture doze and chew. The horse shifts her weight and sparrows hide from the heat. Myself, a bird that flew out of my attic, the whole flock of me fleeing. With a better sense of direction, I could draw a map for you, chart north or a kind of peace like the climbing rose where finches perch and I might build a nest of me. Dawn or dusk, that cusp opens a door to the day's temporal meadows of rue and surprise, or the night's hushed assurance when we sit together, the porch light unmasking, snow falling, or the finest rain. And I have a few copies here, and they are for sale, um, but all the proceeds go to Book Tree. So I just handed them over to Chris and said, sell them and keep it all. So if you are, feel so inclined, please um, do that. This is Sketch in Purple with Every Dusk a Garden. Our lilac towers leans across the path a branch to knock us on the head. Five years we waited for it to bloom. Now it's 10,000 flowers open, tiny cups to catch the certain rain until heavy branches bend. A low-slung bower sent a twilight, brief, then rinsed away, its season done. True, Purple was the color for kings and priests, a dye fashioned from snails and therefore rare. But what a violet tending toward blue, the shadows in snow when we had snow. Hydrangeas shade toward one or the other, does it matter which, this pressure to be right? Grapes look purple, but we call wine red before it stains our lips, our tongues. The scientists say nothing's colored true. It's just the brain's interpretation. Take two steps along the spectrum and perspective shifts. In the alley, money plants blossom before the seed coins, a weed to remind us we are rich. 
so I find myself writing about snow a lot. It's this anxiety. Um, I I just I go through years where I'm afraid that we won't have it ever again. Um, and that was one of the that that kind of feeling about the climate changing so much inspired this poem and the painting when it it talks about a painting and the painting is an Edward Hopper painting. Um, I was also inspired by a story about Boston trying to figure how it could venicize itself in the face of rising sea levels. So we have the grand finale of Boston. Um, this is Come to Stay. The water is rising in the house. The water follows the full moon's invitation over the threshold. The bodies of water running. The water with salt on its tongue licks the carpet's edge, splays out old cat in a patch of sunlight. The water climbs on arthritic limbs, a spray of seaweed in its hair, a seed of mutiny, kernel of catastrophe. The water swells in water, a time-lapse school movie, sets down its roots, sprouts along the walls, seeps up the drapes to swallow the last third of the world. The water is taking over the least and has it in writing. Remember the hall of only air and color, wall and shadow, door agape to a blue wave instead of these wooden steps, the, the dirt path we're walking as the water's moving in, the ocean our avenue, our new address. By water, we will miss the grass, miss the snowdrops and the snow. Thank you. the same memo yeah. <laughs> or got the same Kool-Aid or something. <laughs> the, the, the message must have been make it heavy, make it deep. <laughs> Hold your breath. Shankar Narayan explores identity, power, mythology and technology in a world where the body is flung across borders, yet possesses unrivaled power to transcend them. Shankar is a four-time Pushcart Prize nominee, winner of the 2017 Flyway Sweet Corn Poetry Prize. <laughs> Sweet Corn Poetry Prize. The prize is actual corn. <laughs> and the prize is actual <laughs> corn. Yeah. And has been a, a fellow at Kundaman and at Hugo House. He is a Four Culture Grant recipient for Claiming Space, a project to lift the voices of writers of color. And his chapbook, Postcards from the New World, won the Paper Nautilus debut series chapbook prize. Shankar draws strength from his global upbringing and from his work as a civil rights attorney for the ACL, ACLU. In Seattle, he awakens to the wonders of Cascadia every day, but his heart yearns east to his other hometown, Delhi. Please welcome Shankar. The prize was actual corn, but then they, you know, they send it uh, from Iowa, and it's very, very slow. <laughs> and so when I opened up the corn, it was actually just like full of these worms. <laughs> I complained about it, and they sent me a mug instead. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, so this is the poem from the anthology, and it's called Thanks. They want your thanks. They want to pull it from your body, your body under layers, American leather jacket and steel toe Brahma boots and the places they know you are vulnerable. They claim birthright over your thanks, a rat half crushed on the margin of I-90, point of the spear of the army that invaded wilderness, clear cut trees and civilized you and you are so grateful. Over unknown mounds that may be Indian bones, they want you to mouth your Indian thanks. 
Mouth red with remember in Bethel your grandmother chewed, but she'd say remember this is blood. How to give thanks with a mouth this sucker punched. They want your thanks for every Indian shot, every brown woman violated to produce every half-brown baby, even thanks for knowing the math in half-breed blood, one-quarter, one-fifth, one-eighth, how memories reduce by generation, farther from Brits with mouthfuls of crumpets and tin beef imported from England while you hungered for salt, and when they say, you don't even remember, it was so long ago, you hear gunshots, the thanks they demand for trains that carried you to their jails, for every bullet fired into Jallianwala Bog. Sometimes, when so much thanks is pulled from your body, every cell shrivels, every vein foreign, and all you can do is build a device into which you will pack all your gratitude, like ball bearings and nails, centuries of shrapnel from exploded countries still trying to piece their own digits back together to make a hand to touch anyone's cheek, controlled by a single beholden button on the screen of your cell, which you will tap with tears of thanks, streaming an alluvium of Ganges down your face, so indebted, saying thank you, thank you for letting me be here. Finally, you are, and who's to say you're welcome? <laughs> that is not in that anthology. That is in our forthcoming anthology, Take a Stand, Art Against Hate, which will be out in March. Oh, thank you. We are going to preview at San Antonio AWP. Exciting. March, well, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, there is the chapbook, uh, Postcards from the New World, which was mentioned, also for sale over there. Uh, eight books, uh, which could be a high price for a single poem, but it's a bargain if you think about it as 32 poems, which it kind of is as well. Uh, so this is my seasonal, seasonal special. This is called Christmas Tree. Uh, and, you know, I was, I was hiking today and I ended up... Uh, uh, skinning my knee, and so I spent all the time that I was going to spend deciding what to read in actually managing my knee. Uh, so I'm doing game time decisions here. Uh, Christmas tree. Because I've read the history books, I've seen this picture. Find a beautiful thing and celebrate by killing it. Bring it into your dominion and watch it slowly die. That is the story of my country after all. I have never settled, though I love the hayride, Cascadia's winter air so clean, so different from the Delhi I left behind, my friend's hair so golden in the impossible sun, her children giggling, that I almost feel what it means to be a part of something. But to be colonized means never to recognize belonging. So when you feel something like it, you question, Wonder if that voice rasping, outsider, outsider, really means it. And then the blade, the hacksaw to the tree, hunkered into the curve of the hillside. And when we choose it, we choose it for its perfection. Though the voice resists, says no, don't be so beautiful, because it seems blameless. Like the peasant so exquisite, she draws the king's eye, and he points to her and says, that one, and after his procession with its stallions and imported elephants, the guards come, drag her from her hovel as she wails, but her father and mother do nothing, because helplessness has colonized their bodies from deep inside. And now, I too have failed to speak up again. It is too late for this little pine on this hopelessly gorgeous day in which I am losing myself on this radiant hillside, radiant as the queen in her marriage procession, freighted in emeralds and conquest diamonds, perfect even if she does not smile. And it's possible, even if I do not remember, that it is my own hands that seize one half of the hacksaw, and it is my own back that bends to the grim work of severance of drawing in the teeth 
jagging first through unresisting bark, then deeper and deeper through xylem and phloem and into the deepest heartwood. And who knew that felling a single spindly tree would be so difficult? But if nonetheless I put all my might into the killing, it is because my friend's smile glitters on the other side of the blade. I sap all my strength to do this, though I can see the future so clearly. After the tinsel, the lights, the ornaments, hung one by one, each with a history. After I am encircled in the glow of this family who love me, then the icy curb where the pine lies on its side, stripped of all adornment. And I will go back to my cold living room, which I have tried to warm with my own small tree, with tiny lights that shine when plugged in. It sends its burn so deep inside me. It's fake, though. <laughs> Alright, one, one last one because I know you all are eager to get to the open mic. So let's go no. for no. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so this is uh, who here has been to the Cephalopod Appreciation Society's annual meeting? Who here who here knows what a cephalopod is? Okay. Okay. This is a literary, <laughs> an erudite crowd. Uh, well, you know, they're 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 mollusks. Uh, octopuses are cephalopods. They're incredibly intelligent. But the main thing is that the Cephalopod Appreciation Society's annual meetings are completely awesome. They are among the most fun literary events that we have in town, and they've gotten like bigger and bigger and bigger. And this year, like. 250 people showed up and, you know, packed the Hugo House Theater and it, it was really cool. So I wrote this for that. It's called Love Letter from Immigrant to Octopus. <laughs> we are impossible creatures, five octopus lifetimes into this country, impossible to unfamiliar tongues. Enter Octopus Deflaney, Shankar Rajamani. Enter God, with infinite arms, mesmerized past ironic borders to America's dark waters, where we den and hide from ice-cold predators, eyes huge and omnivorous for things just beyond our grasping, stealing colors of our captors. We are lovers, loving to death, then feeding our bodies to each other, to something larger than our lives, like your parents working sweatshop jobs for so many lifetimes for the small miracle of you. Sacrifice the body and move on. Master your disguise, ink wisely, obfuscate when necessary to survive, curiosity immune to catastrophe. How can we be still when the wild world beckons just beyond that glass border? Octopus, I feel the art of your escape, unstoppable no matter how small the opening, compress the mortal body to the size of a hungry mouth, the only solid thing you own, swallow the pulse and go. This is what freedom is. Taste its eightfold embrace, dozens of suckers, thousands of hooks, meaning hang on to what you love with everything you've got. And when what you love is a distant sea the gray skies keep drizzling into, remember all oceans are yours, and the limb you dip in the Duwamish is already touching Mumbai. In the end, become your own parachutes, unfurling into a milky way of inconceivable appendages, defy the odds and thrive, dwarf to world-swallowing God in three paces. Nurture our hidden weapons, the poison turning blue rings in your throat, a secret apocalypse to be unleashed with divine grace, a dance that ignites the cosmos. Open your arms, leave them all stunned. Touch the vein just under the skin of your white lover's wrist, already turning colors you've never seen. 
feel her blood pulse blue, feel coral borders, galaxies collapsing. Who knew this consuming would be so beautiful? In this country, everyone desires royalty, but only you have three hearts. One for here, one for elsewhere, and one for the world beyond glass, in which you will never be whole. Thank you, folks. You're just in time. <laughs> Gary Copeland Lilly is the author of eight books of poetry, the most recent being The Bushman's Medicine Show from Lost, Lost Horse Press in 2017. And a chapbook, The Hog Killing from Blue Horse Press 2018. He is originally from North Carolina and now lives in the Pacific Northwest. He has received a the Washington, D.C. Commission on the Arts Fellowship for Poetry. He is published in numerous anthologies and journals, including Best American Poetry 2014, Willow Springs, The Swamp, Waxwing, The Taos International Journal of Poetry, and the African American Review. He is a Kaveh Kanem Fellow. Carrie. Thank you. You know what? I'm really, I'm really sorry. I missed that reading. I, I left, I left Fort Townsend at 3:30, actually. Oh. Yeah. So I, I've been stuck in traffic and all oh. sorts of, of calamities happen. But oh. you, know. you made it. Yeah. Yeah, I got here before everything was done. I'm glad. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's terrible. You know. So, but you know, I kind of, man, I missed it. Oh, there'll be more. Right on. <laughs> Ah, I'm going to do a few poems. I have my book somewhere. It's caught in that bag right over there. Bag? Here? Yeah, thank you. Plenty of time. <laughs> I'm gonna zoom in in a minute. I was in a fast car driving hard. That one damn thought was rocking through my rat motor mind. I was driving my Chevy South. Candy red and pile of super sport. Rescue from a farmer's barn. Park when the sun flew off to the desert storm. Rowdy wheels and Dirty windshield, tired drivers getting the hell out of my way. The morning air was cool. Highway hum blew through the window with that melancholy whine. As you only hear when you're driving along. Began the rain that draw drizzle. And I was creeping through the Dixie Mist. And there were pilgrims looking for a gas station with a clean bathroom. Maybe styrofoam, cups of cold coffee. Drivers were sitting erect like. Everyone locked into their own red eyes of existence. Construction work started choking the road, and construction workers were standing idly in the third lane in their steel toed shoes and their stiff jeans, and they were scratching their asses, they were adjusting their crotches, they were spitting red man juice gasoline and the oil sheen that was on the road. 
I grabbed the jack, drank the last corner, Captain Empty shoved it back because I don't want John Law looking at me. That two cardinals on a dogwood branch and it said welcome to North Carolina home of Jesse Helms <laughs> 50 years backwards as the Jim Crow flies <laughs> and I was driving home to figure this out What's the deal with a woman who doesn't put herself completely into a kiss? The most intimate act of anything you will ever do. If she can't put herself completely into a kiss, you ain't got beyond surface. Maybe you never will. And that, my friends, is the first sign I miss but her cold kisses meet it out like spare change. And I just roared my red car home and I screamed out my open window that I don't know one damn thing. to the school with me <laughs> and then you can do whatever you want to do you know but uh, I was fortunate enough to have seen New Orleans uh, before any of that so I kind of kind of knew what the loss was so can't write a poem or about the storm because I wasn't there doing the storm, but I didn't go there to write poems anyway. But I ended up writing them after all those years that I did that relief work down there. Um, and this is this is one that's called Why I, Why I Don't Believe in Levies. <laughs>
down this unholy flood. Let me simply. Go all night. Huh? Yeah. Let me you simply. Go all night for all I care. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I got a lot of murder ballads. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm from North Carolina and like, well, everybody like to play. Like, you know, I, this is what I noticed about, about, about the, the West Coast. You know, when people here, they play mountain music, they are so nice with it and stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they never do murder ballads, you know. They never do them. I'm like, that's that's a part of it, man. You know, but they don't do them like. But there's always redemption in a murder ballad. That's true. It's always redemption. It's like this. This is what I did. It was wrong, and now I'm paying the penalty for it. That's what a murder ballad is. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. But you know.
and basically I, I end up staying. So, so. Asheville. Homeless angels sing in the city in the mountain hollers and evergreen. North Carolina, land of the slave drive, Highway 40 through the home of the brave, Thomas Wolf and O. Henry. But ain't no monument for anybody Cherokee, except at the cigar store. <laughs> well, let me stop and catch my breath. Got to cut out smoking these damn cigarettes and dragging my butt in Asheville. Screw the pop guns, damn the magnum, the hollow point loaded American cannon. Got dog-eared pages of Gene Tumor, the whole revolution, the black arts movement. Mix them together and work it like a potion. Come on now, put me to the test. I'll bust a poem to my last cigarette down Highway 40 off the bypass. Low hourly wage at the textile. 300 miles from my family, ain't none of us crazy handling snakes, the misdemeanors and the felonies. Teachers, hustlers, lawyers, and ministers, this colorful wave of saints and sinners get together for the holidays and drink and smoke and deal the cards Jesus saves. A backwood church and cemetery libations at the graves of the ancestors. Uh, here's, a, here's a Northwest home driving at night towards the Hood Canal. Even when I am not speeding I get stopped for speeding and there is no room for a question to a cop positioning his shooting stance outside my roll down window in the dangerous wash of red and blue lights. The Dirty Harry Dixie, a murder soundtrack we both know is plain and there is no protest from or protection for me, there is the skin of the skim of this moment. 
that thin layer of skin covering the whole situation. There is only the space of a breath between what should happen and what could happen. Mm -hmm. Prayer that is in my blood. Let me see the sun slip over the world in the morning. I need to see God turn up the light. I stood on the back porch at night, smoking a cigar under the holes that once held stars. My five word prayer. Lord, have mercy on me. I need to find the old tree with a hollow at the base and maybe with some roots exposed to place my offering. Lucero, the healer, the wind, the rain, the storm are all in his beggar man hands. He is the crossroad to my ancestors, the uncles I never met. George and Buddy, grandsons of Jedediah, avengers of my mother. They are buried in Perquimans County off Low Ground Road. How do family deal with murder when we have murdered? Lord, have mercy on me. What would make Lumbee Jim attack my 16-year-old mother? before she became my mother. What would make him come to the house and kick in the door? The eclipse is Lucero arriving, messenger of God. The Muerto has come with him and now walks with me. There are things my mother never talked about. I find my answers in the cemetery. I need to see the sun at the edge of the world. Centralia, my guide, leads me down the line of family graves. I am steeped in the manner which most of my people worship, gave praise to the God who delivered them from slavers to live at the edge of the great dismal swamp. Lucero, Centralia, and Muerto, and me knee boning in the wilderness, a string of purple beads at the tombstone of my folk. Lord, have mercy on me. I am born of drunken crime. Lucero, the lifeblood of justice, integrity, the keeper of moral law. Government law does not always do what is right. I hold down the anger, keep the muerto in check. Lucero makes things right. I need to see that red glow come over the horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll do one more. One more. One more. Okay. This one. Um, In 9-11, I, I was in D.C., and like, uh, I spent a lot of time in New York. I used to live in New York. And so I had all that kind of stuff happening with me when that went down. And there were a lot of, of, of like writers in D.C., a lot of the poets um, were, immediately there was a call to do an anthology. I'm talking about that same week and stuff, right? <coughs> You know, and I, and I, I was asked if I wanted to participate in it, if I wanted to contribute a poem. I told them, I, I, I haven't even processed what the hell happened, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. I can't write no poem yet and stuff. I didn't even know it was even going to be something. I didn't know <coughs> if I would ever write a poem again. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, really, you know, 
this was this was like you know there were thousands of people that died. I, I, but I, and I figure my my argument that everybody was going to be writing about the same images because they all had watched the same news stations, and so, um, but they didn't have anything yet to to mark a difference in their lives and stuff. Which I thought that would be the most interesting thing, is that because witnessing isn't about what necessarily happens, it's about how you respond to what has happened. So, and that was my take. And then eventually, a poem did come to me, and it's um, it's, it's a ranter poem. Uh, standing on the corner when being cool went blind, which is you know. It's a song of war. I don't know if you if you know about war, but the band. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've been slipping in the darkness, that one. Mm -hmm. You know, whoa, 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 and pretty soon you gonna pay. You know, that one. <laughs> yeah, baby, I'm the bush man. Everybody know me, a talking drum. I am the oral tradition, the griot of the cigarette. No bullshit. Ain't nothing but the truth. Everything I tell you is airtight and waterproof. I can hoodoo and close view this neighborhood's future from the vanish of my stoop. Get down like I'm proud. I like mud claw, so let that be my sanctified role. Preach asked me what my religion was, and I told him I channeled John Coltrane and became a devout musician. I have always been a child of God. If you don't believe me, just ask my blessed, beloved mom. But tell me, why do God's children have to experience every test? And exactly how much of a blessing comes with a financial offering? Well, consider the fact that all our damn deeds need to be sermonized. And somewhere deep in that sin darkness, there's always a crack of light. It ain't for sale, but nothing in this world is half price. And if what you end up with does not satisfy, nobody's giving you that money back. Can you see me in that light with the children of God, those blues people with the hanks riding them hard? Please do tell all the other infidels that I believe the choruses falling out of the mouths of the raggedy people that I'm around are the actual utterances of saints. Um, I will begin with uh, the poem that was in um, Last Call. What movie to watch? A few days after my mom's 90th birthday, my sister Jackie called and asked if I had read my emails this morning. I did not. Mom died this morning. I talked to mom four days ago. She sounded better than she had for quite some time. We talked about old movies, about Cary Grant, and we laughed. When she turned the phone over to my dad, I said, I love you. She would usually just say, you too. But this time she said, I love you too. Here's your dad. Sometimes the quiet and stillness, even with jazz from the NPR station playing in the background, is comforting. Now it is surreal as an overwhelming number of memories mash into each other, old 8mm home movie images flickering <coughs> Kodak moments. Later, when I talked to Dad, he said his last words last night to her were, I love you. When he left for church service this morning, she was still sleeping. When he returned and checked on her, he saw her eyes open, her lips slightly apart, he sighed, oh, Gussie. He is glad she went first. She's such a private person. It's good she didn't have to deal with someone else trying to take care of her. She couldn't take care of herself, you know. I'm grateful for this. We've been together 67 years, and I've never really ever been alone. Mom and Dad moved nearly 44 years ago to an assisted living community a few miles from my sister and brother-in-law. Mom didn't go out, didn't socialize, refused to go to the doctors, and even if forced, was uncooperative. But in recent weeks, medications were adjusted, things seemed to be improving. Dad is glad family is close by. I'm not going to worry about anything for at least a month. 
there's a lot to do right now with Easter, Good Friday, Stations of the Cross. A lot I'm involved with, but I'm not going to do anything for a month. Good dad, I say. You have the right priorities. Take care of your... Yeah, take care of myself, he agrees. And then alongside. I'm not sure what to do. I just want to talk to her some more. We argued sometimes, got mad, but I never thought of being without her. I want to talk to her some more, ask her, what movie do you want to watch? <laughs> Mary Crane. Oh, right. <laughs> and next is Thomas Prince. Do you want to read last or do you want to go next? Um, I'll go next. Okay. Well, just because Chris did, I'm going to read the poem I had in last call also. It's called Post Apocalypse. After the apocalypse, came warm rain, a hole of light, hazy in the dark sky. Can you feel the end of the long deep breath like kelp suspended? The smell of damp earth falling in the arms of a lover returning from the war, trying to remember how to weep. Thank you. Come on down, Thomas. Hello. <coughs> Pardon me a sec. <coughs> okay. That's a good clip. <laughs> okay. Um, this was written in September 25th in 2014. It's called Tornado. I dance in the eye of the tornado. It doesn't get any higher than this. Undue pressure. Breath sucked out. It doesn't get any lower than this. I hear the howling of poets repeating the same verse over and over and over, <laughs> as if unable to do otherwise, unable to contain the howling wind of their continuous voices, each a different refrain, a cacophony of words all fraught with deep meaning. I dance to this sound, mesmerized, swirling around. I, I see pages torn from books and shredded by the relentless wind, never to be seen and only rumored to have been and gone. As I dance, I reach out, grasping at shards before they are sucked into the stratosphere up and beyond, ultimately into outer space, detritus in the space-time continuum, Maybe to strike some future wayward pioneer wandering aimlessly through piles of broken words. Shattered dreams of fame and fortune, searching for a glimpse of an unknown master or swirling about the storm with sands of time ripping at his flesh. I twitch to the beat, the wind pounding a conga, left carelessly on a balcony after a neighborhood serenade. Lifted to the sky, it resonates. It's a danceable beat. Counterpoint and rhythmic booms, multiple booms and shocks, blasting my ears with decibel shock. The wind howls. <laughs> and voices shout over and over and over. Only sometimes in tune, as I spin to the beat of the wild wind spun, I find partners in paintings, in photos and randomized rhymes, symbols so meaningless except in my mind or other searching chaos a sublime glimpse of divine. Spiral tornado vacuums. Up goes the house. It falls on no witches speaking poetic spells. Sirens scream in the background. Dark, drunk basements of the past, now exposed to the light, reveal others here with me, spinning and twirling. There are no rubber slippers. There is no way to go home. Shelby. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's a poem for my son who died in May. I regret to inform you. I am hurting, and all of you in your gestures are irrelevant to my loss. 
Here are some flowers. Really? I am in no mood. Oops. To see or smell the joyous sexual organs of living things, I do not say. Here is a packet of words I give you for your grief. These I drop to the floor to the growing pile of words. Here is a cake. No cake. If I let this sweetness pass into my mouth, I will turn to mud. Or Natalie? I'll just do one. So um, it's a poem called Journey to My Country of Fire. Um, there's a time to observe fall losing itself in the rust, the gold, and the crimson. There is a time to follow the white and crystal advance of winter on the livid landscape. There is a time to be quiet and to smile with our red lips and the fire shivering in our eyes. This is the time when my ancient mother tongue mixes with the newly born, gives birth to a language where words are sparse and mist combined. This is the time when the inquisitive woman immerses herself into the world, wearing her string of awareness and pins a brooch of pearls of longing to her left breast. This is the time when the peacock-colored kite in its trail of loneliness fires the sky with green flames. This is the time when past, present, and future are sealed together in a curved, curved side triangle, the black and red ornament, adornment of a salish carving. This is the time when the incursions of wrinkled native hands, the tenderness of an eye, the roughness of a cheek, the ebony of long hair shine for those who dance with their solar plexus open and dream with their fingers join in a mute prayer. This is a time when I open my eyes, the world erupts in smooth white lava sprinkled with red diamonds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rita. Right, this is a song. It's called Ling. Howling wind, showing teeth, breaking hearts, the whittled bird. Next day comes, will it bleed? Take me to greet it. Will you take it all down? Listen, that's the sound of the cries, the mother's hand out offering the last bite. Stretched out on sand, water coming in and back out again, breathing the swells burrowing a wound in the ancient silt, reaching an arm out towards sunlight, the one with the ring on a thumb glistening. This time is ours. Listen, we are. We are in fear of losing something. We are shouting at each other. We are. This time is ours. Can you feel it? All things come in and go out again. Listen. I can hear your heart. That's my heart in the waves of fury. All things come in and go out again. Can you still hear my heart in the waves of fury? I still hear your heart. All things come in and go out again. Listen, this time is ours. <laughs> I seek solace in my notebook at long last. These days I grow tired of the sound of my voice, talking about the heartbreak, losing my mom. This season comes in heavy, in all its celebratory darkness, its bone-chilling nostalgia. Having no true desire to forget my dear mom, the woman who gave me life and taught me how to live it, in so many different ways, could never have taught me how to live on without her. 
how to carry the grief and to sort through the memory of her final days, the pain and fear of her last moments. And today, it can be so hard to navigate the simple things, like getting up out of bed, or buying groceries in a store full of seasonal holiday cheer and merchandise from Mother's Day to Easter to Memorial Day to my birthday, Father's Day, the 4th of July, to Mom's birthday month of October, to her beloved Halloween, and now Thanksgiving, and on to the big one, which is Christmas. It's hard for me not to bust out in a flood of tears, still at random moments, at the sight or the thought of familiar yet unexpected things that spark my memory. Today, even grocery shopping online got me going as I checked on the black olives. I remembered the family holiday gatherings and how the table in my mom's house always had a tray of olives among the hors d'oeuvres and how she and I would sit there and talk about life. And now I understand why my father doesn't want to celebrate the holidays. And I don't know how to feel except that it hurts a lot to remember the close bond with all its complications. And it's tempting to try to block the memories, but I don't ever want to lose them because they're all I have left of her. For the people in the outer circles, in the rest of the world, life moves on. The empathy and condolences fade as the tide washes over us. Eventually, even close friends and loved ones grow weary, lose interest, long for your attention the way it used to be. Thank you, everybody. We have lots of books and uh, connected with tonight's reading, the Stealing Light Anthology. Um, we have a couple of last calls. We have books from Shankar and Joni and uh, Martha and some guy named Paul. <laughs> and, um, so anyway. Buy an anthology. It's a great gift. And all the money goes to the bookstore. There you go. Excellent. So thank you all, and Gary, if you would be kind of, I know I'm twisting your arm and it's hard to ask. Maybe. There's something in your repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> Thanksgiving was well, my mother's favorite holiday. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I went home a couple of years ago because I, I went home like five years mm -hmm. ago because she asked me to come home. Oh, that's right. And I was gone for about three years, um, going through everything. And uh, that was a difficult time. I haven't been home but once since. <laughs> you know, Did you get caught in th Thanksgiving traffic? Was it Thanksgiving traffic? Yeah, it was. I, I guess, you know. Yeah, I just didn't, I, I haven't been home because there's, I don't get home anymore. No. No. So, I'm, I can't remember what you are. Definitely. We're going through a cycle of holidays. Mm -hmm. We're going through that missing period. Um, that, that loved one. Definitely. Um, the only thing that, that, that redeemed me in the eyes of my mother about this guitar <laughs> you know, because that's like her son had fallen. <laughs> you know, that that was her take on that. Oh my God, he, he comes home with a guitar. You know, <laughs> but when her car pulled into the in, into the yard, yeah, whatever I was playing is instantly gospel. <laughs> I, I don't care because she walked through the door. You know, let me just have some gospel going on. <laughs> that, so that's so the only thing that kind of kind of gave her some redemption with me and, and this instrument and stuff, you know. <laughs> and I was standing by my window on 
on a cold and cloudy day When I saw that Earth come rolling Just to carry Circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. There's a bed of home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Undertaker, oh Undertaker, won't you please try a stone? That's my mother, that's your carrion, Lord I hate. circle be unbroken by and by on by and by there's a bed of home awaiting in the sky Lord in the sky I try to follow close behind her. I try to hold up and be brave. Oh Lord, nothing could hold my sorrow when they.